I mean, I'll, I'll start the program by pretending that uh, we haven't spoken to Jai yet, but we have. Uh, so uh, stay tuned for Jai Hitchcock, who's very good. And it's all about life in Toulouse. Looking forward to speaking to him later. Uh, <laughs> Uh, special Friday edition of the program. I, I couldn't do one on Monday for scheduling reasons, and I thought, well, there's no point doing one then because there's games on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, so we'll do it on Friday, and then we'll come back on Monday again. Um, Phil, we've got lots of uh, lots of news going on, uh, mainly tuna on pizza, yes or no? Uh, well, I don't mind pineapple on a pizza, so I'm probably the wrong person to ask, but. Um... Not a fan of tuna at the best of times. So for me, tuna on nothing. So you're in Sam Tompkins. Uh... I don't. I yes. I, I see he's tweeting about the important things. Anyway, how to upset a potential sponsor? You would think that they would have um, someone would tell these people just just don't do that. I know you're frustrated or whatever that you've got free peaks and it's rubbish, but don't do that. Eighty-one percent of our poll. Well, do you like the polls they have on TV? What do you think of Brexit? Um, should you wear a mask? What do you think of tuna on pizza? 81 percent say no. Really? Uh, 172 people. Uh, Carson, though, our man in uh, Switzerland. Sweet corn on pizza is more disgusting. Uh, Mark says it isn't as bad as pineapple on pizza. So, uh, Dr. Bison, this is a crime against humanity. I wouldn't quite go that far, but uh, it's good to know that the passions are stirred by something. It, it is rugby league. Um, before we get on to this week's games, which we'll we'll talk about briefly, um, big news in Australia this morning. We'll talk about more about this on Monday as well, because you would assume with how the press works that there will be more to come over the weekend. Uh, Sam Burgess all over the press in Australia, and as it's turned out over here as well, Phil, not really much we can say about the allegations because they're obviously being denied by uh, Sam Burgess and Souths and so on and so forth, but not a good look for anyone involved at the moment. I suspect that the only thing it's a good look for is investigative journalism. Um, and I think we've always on this programme and the various channels that uh, that are associated with it have always said that there is an absolute place for um, this sort of questioning and this this kind of, of, of um, trying to get to the true facts of something that's taken over four months to uncover it. There's loads of different sources that have been accessed. Um, how it plays out is separate to the fact that it's now in the public domain. There are conspiracy theorists saying it's been deliberately timed uh, to coincide with the, the final series and, and South being in it. Again, you know, if, if anybody has ever been involved in a project of longevity, the one thing you don't know is when it's actually going to end. Um, so I think, you know, to start something four months ago with the express desire of being able to get it out on a given weekend when the final start is nonsense. Um, it, it's, I think what, what again, people have said who perhaps, uh, you're right, we'll, we'll hear a little bit more as, as this now becomes uh, common knowledge is clearly Sam Burgess has stood down from his current commitments, both at the club and media wise. Souths have issued the only statement they can issue at the moment saying they're taking all of these allegations seriously, but clearly a lot of it is aimed at them as a club and the way that they've um, the way they've handled all this situation, how much explicit involvement they had in it at the time. All of that is going to come out. Um, all, all I would say is that um, I just hope we don't forget the victims in all of this. I mean, clearly Sam is the person who the uh, spotlight is on and his behaviour, but his behaviour has materially affected other people if that is proved to be the case. They are the victims in this. It would appear, and again, I don't think we can prejudge it and we're not trying to, we're not apportioning blame because we haven't heard both sides of the story and all the evidence isn't out yet, but it would appear that um, his ex-wife obviously is 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 the chief complainant in all of this and, and has suffered more than anybody else. I just hope she's being looked after. And, um, and, and as we've said a million times before, rugby league is no different to any other walk of life. Um, it's how you deal with things, it's how you acknowledge things, it's how you take responsibility for things. Um, and, and if Sam has issues himself, 
then I hope he gets the treatment that uh, that he would need if treatment is the right word. But uh, yeah, it's a sorry tale. Um, we don't know, you know, clearly how far up the ranks of South Sydney it reaches. You know, you know, is, is Russell Crowe going to be implicated as the owner of the club? Is has Wayne Bennett got anything to do with it as the coach of the club? Clearly his relationship with Sam and the Burgess boys was like that of a father. You know, all of this is going to come out. And um, I'm not bothered it's not a good look for the sport. I just hope that the people who have been the most affected get the most help. And it's not just Burgess himself, is it? When you look at the, the allegations of cover-ups and so on and so forth, there are important people involved in this case high up in the club uh, and the sport and and of course there'll be people who were at south with uh sam who will now be playing in our competition so this story is going to you would assume run and run and have lots of people implicated in it who uh well, they might be a bit worried as we speak this afternoon well it's also going to come back to his time in rugby union and i'm um, no doubt some of the people in that sport will be saying told you so whether they're justified to say that or not um, yeah, and, and and Sam is one of the is a bit like Sonny Bill, where he transcends rugby league. You know, he, he he clearly was destined to have a media career in Australia. I dare say that if he come back here, you know, Strictly Come Dancing probably would have been giving him a ring because he, he's that much of a name. Yeah, not great. I I do think um, again there is an issue which which is the you know let's be general about this because we cannot be specific but we ask our players to do ridiculous amounts of, of physical duress and behind that to be able to do that are medical practices that enable them to do that uh, they're not illegal um, the morality of them is is that's going to come up in a in a different era we, we're looking at concussion at the moment and saying look there are some some guys from 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 15 20 years ago who are now walking around with complaints that perhaps we could have done more about if we'd have known more and and if you extrapolate that you know we, we know that people like malcolm alka were talking about the the use of prescription drugs they weren't illegal but they were helping people merely get through the wear and tear of playing this game and that's why we ban the shoulder the charge we bought in the HIA protocols I, you know all of the, the the medicine the science behind professional sport should constantly be looked at and and yeah you know, we, we've seen games this week where players are going to be playing what three games in nine days and and it is a hell of an ask we, we've seen some young kids who perhaps have had call-ups in advance of of maybe when when they would have made their scheduled debuts and the one thing we don't know um, is we help them all we can with the science and the medicine behind it but actually is it doing them more long-term damage and I, I think you know aside from this particular issue with Sam and his family all of this procedure of meeting in clandestine places to be taking things to enable you to play a chosen sport to entertain us effectively you know we're involved in all of this as well um it all needs looking at i know it's i guess this is the the one conspiracy i, I do believe in but i i still can't believe and we're 10 years now was the anniversary was was last week wasn't it the death of terry newton I, I still can't believe in a world where only a handful of people have ever tested positive for human growth hormone that Terry Newton is the only person in rugby used it. And, you know, it, 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 people take shortcuts in, in every walk of life, whether it's speeding or taking drugs in sport or whatever. Um, you just hope that people get the help they need, whatever that is. And, you know, the situation at the moment obviously is a mess and hopefully it can be resolved to the best possible outcome for the victims whoever they may be going forward as you say phil um yesterday the rfl launched a uh, sport-wide action plan to make rugby league a truly inclusive sport by tackling discrimination and breaking down any barriers to involvement rugby league versus discrimination tackle it Sets out four strategic goals and crucially the specific and measurable actions that will be taken to achieve them. Uh, coincided with the beginning of Black History Month, which is, of course, uh, October. Um, good to see the RFL doing this. Uh, as someone pointed out to me on Twitter yesterday, we must be one of the sports that is as inclusive as can be, but that hard work can never stop. 
Yeah, I think, again, um, and, and you mentioned it in the past, um, as a document, as, as a, a laying out of principles, absolutely you would applaud it, back it, do whatever you could to support it. But we've got to find out what it actually means in practice as well, that um, f for it to be more than just laudable words, what are we going to do about it? I think there's a really interesting debate at the moment about taking the knee and how long you do that before it starts to lose some impact. And, you know, I'm really interested to read about what Les Ferdinand was saying about it with, with QPR. And um, clearly, he, he, you know, he's a, he's a guy who, who sees it from, from the round. You know, he's, he's been involved in, in incidents uh, personally, and, and, and he would want there to be a, a change in the way society is seen uh, to, to benefit people of colour, of which he is one. And if he's saying, and uh, Britta Sombolonga at, uh, I think, Middlesbrough as, as captain of their team is saying, well, you know, we, we don't see the need to to be taking the knee. I think there comes a point where you say words and, and objectives are fine. But in practice, what does that mean? Uh, and, uh, and without getting overly political in the current climate that we're in, it's all about the message. If you if you mix the message or it's it's not immediately understandable exactly where you stand or sit or kneel on a particular issue, then it can be either misconstrued or lose its meaning. Um, so I'm all for it, but I think we just need to know what it's actually going to mean. I believe the the Super League clubs are are going to have a round that is. Um, uh, you know, we're going to back this up, and and we're, the World Cup is going to is going to do likewise. But um, it has to be more than gesture politics, and and I, I'm sure it will be. There's, there's some really important people out there who are behind it. The other thing again is how and who enforces it. You know, if somebody breaches whatever a code is, um, you know, is it the responsibility of the governing body? They would say we, we govern, we don't um, enforce. Uh, is it the responsibility of a club if somebody happens to have a, you know, a, 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 a logo on their social media feed that would leave you to indicate that they're a fan or a supporter of that club? Do they have to take action? Does it depend on what site? Is it an official site or an unofficial site? You're, you're in really muddy waters. And, and I think it's fine to put out um, a, a, a statement of intent. But, how, you know, if you don't wear a mask, that now is an offence in certain, it's actually an offence, but who is policing it? So you can have the best intentions in the world, it can be done for all the right reasons, but if you can't back it up and enforce it, it's open to interpretation stroke abuse. Uh, positive news in the World Cup. Uh, this morning, uh, the ticket launch has exceeded early expectations, says a press release in front of me, as the rugby league family, your favourite phrase, Phil, uh, shows their appetite and passion en masse for what promises to be the biggest and best rugby league tournament in history. Uh, I've obviously bought my tickets for the uh, doubleheader at Anfield, so I, I can feel justifiably proud that I'm part of this uh, early success. No numbers in there, but the fact that every game in the tournament has had a ticket sold um, is, is, is positive news. And then, you know, we, we continue to be positive about this World Cup. I think it's fantastic. I think it's a massive credit to the organisers who've done a brilliant job in the way that they presented the tournament to people to get them excited about it in the first place. I think it's important that we've all got something to look forward to in these most uncertain of times. And I think it's great that particularly people who will be worried about their own uh, personal finances at this time are still prepared to commit uh, to, to something that they're, they're clearly so looking forward to. And uh, that's really encouraging, and, and and I know having spoken to a couple of the organisers that th this isn't candy floss. They're, they're not just saying this in a hope that it'll drive. So they are uh, genuinely impressed with the numbers that have logged on and bought tickets. That the volume of tickets that individuals are buying. I mean, there are some people buying you know thirty, forty, fifty tickets across a whole range of games. Um, the fact that the tickets are brilliantly priced. So I think, again, you know, they're, they're, they're not low enough to demean the competition. They're not high enough to put anybody off. They've, they've pitched it exactly right. They're doing it in um, a, a way you can buy a, a, you know, a block of tickets for, for a venue or a, a certain number of games. Absolutely brilliant. And I'd, I just hope that uh, they become so sought after that the next sort of press releases we're getting is if you don't get your tickets soon, there aren't going to be any left. 
Uh, now I've gone on to uh, social media to get the results up for uh, Super League this week, which we'll talk about. Black History Round, as you uh, mentioned, uh, round 17, fixtures of the 22nd and 23rd of October. So a nice little birthday present for me. Um, so uh, that will be uh, uh, backed up by outstanding biographies of unforgettable players, including Billy Boston, Clive Sullivan and Leon Price. They'll be featured across the Super League digital channels over the coming weeks, starting with Lucius Banks, who in 1912 became the first black professional rugby league player at uh, Hunslet. So looking forward to learning a lot more about uh, people I might not have heard of before. Which is fantastic. And and that, again, is a way of um, of actually putting something out there that is educational. And I think, as we've said with all of this, if we can all learn uh, about what it is that, you know, uh, it's, it not only is, is the backstory of the game, but why it's important to to claim that we we are um, accessible and inclusive, then you can only do that by fully understanding your history. And, and, and I, there'll be some difficult tales in there as well, people who've had to overcome things to, to achieve. And, uh, and, and I think level playing fields are what we all strive for. Uh, so we had uh, a week of uh, fixtures, midweek fixtures, uh, featuring lots of young players, uh, as we'll mention with Jai in a few moments. Um, were you at the game at uh, Headingley, Phil? I was. Oh, so you actually got to see it as opposed to some people on our league. I mean, the thing is, that I, I I was able to watch Wakefield Huddersfield perfectly fine the other week, so I've had no issues with the app. Obviously, I couldn't watch the games this week because I'm not a season ticket holder of any of the clubs, but Leeds obviously made uh, a lot of uh, changes, as they, well, pretty much every team is involved in the semi-finals. Um, lots of young players coming through. As you mentioned, lots of uh, second-generation players coming through as well. Um, Ellery Hanley's son apparently played for Wigan uh, against St Helens. It does seem that in every game this week, I've not seen any criticism really of, of the clubs who've made changes in terms of if they've gone out and lost as, as Wigan did heavily to St Helens because I think more and more people are aware of the, the slightly bigger picture at play here. I think there's only one issue that I was left with having watched either uh, on on our host broadcaster or live in the ground this uh, next generation come through. Um, it's like the sequel, isn't it? Super League, the next generation. Um, Nineteen players got given their debuts apparently across the across the games. My, my only concern is not that each and every one of them can carry that moment with great pride in their hearts. A lot of them for the club that do it will get a number, um, and, and you know to to get that alone is is, is a massive achievement. Um, but what is the plan? Um, I, I know that there will be some of the midweek rounds coming up and um, some of the kids who have impressed may get a second opportunity. But if you are 17, 18, 19 and your way is blocked um, by your players who will play for the next two or three years until you get more of a regular opportunity, then what are we going to do with these kids? You know, they're, they, they're, they're too good to go back into the academy system. They're probably not opportunity to play a reserve grade which is something that we never really defined what that should be um, because that's now on hold but also I'm not sure again that we, we we had that level of competition that would have tested them some of them will go on loan or dual registration or possibly even sign for for championship and league one clubs but we we haven't got a career path and I think that's what worries me more than anything that either we're producing kids who are going to get picked off by the NRL and put into their development systems, a, a bit like we're seeing with Canberra, who are, who are really looking at, at some of our best young players, or we're preparing them for a career in rugby union. If, if I'd been a rugby union scout at Headingley on Wednesday in the rain, and I'd seen at least two or three of those young Leeds players who are, will be on a pittance of money at the moment because that's what you get for being an academy player. But I saw their physical development and the effort that they put in and what they managed to do over the course of the 80 minutes. I'd be saying for a very small investment, I'll take that person and over a couple of years, uh, teach them the, the nuances and intricacies of our sport. But we've got a ready-made athlete there. And what we just need to be really careful of is that we're not the finishing school for another sport. It, it may well be that even though they're having their own financial issues as well as being well publicised because of the current situation, that even if they are having those uh, issues, that 
as you say, because the young players in Rugby League are, are so cheap that they might still be cheaper than uh, one of their own ready-made products. It's not that they're so cheap, it's that they're so developed physically and uh, and aerobically. Um, and I think what we've seen across all the teams that, that put young players out, you know, Kai Pierce-Paul, um, who, who was uh, uh, made his debut for Wigan, from Bromley in Kent, that well-known rugby league area. Um, the likes of Josh Thewlis, who again looked really good when he made his debut a year ago, but this is the second time that we've seen him. So, you know, in that year, has he been able to develop as a player and what? when will he get his next opportunity? But he looked really good for Warrington, just picking out, you know, a couple. Liam Tyndall at Leeds um, would be the one again that you'd look at and go this kid's really got something but at the moment he's either a fullback or a winger and those slots are all taken for the foreseeable future if people remain fit and and once you've had a, a, a sight of these young kids you want to feel that they're going to stay and be developed by your sport and my my only concern is not that we're producing them we clearly are it's how do we retain them Kai Pierce Paul could become the next Josh Walters in terms of uh players from odd places scoring uh, grand final winning tries. It may even be this year. Um, we'll, we'll talk about the Challenge Cup semi-finals after we've spoken to Giant, a kind of hilarious uh, bit of work that I mean I have more work to do on this programme. Um, but this Can week, you tell uh, me what, what wins the um, 4.30 at Kempton? <laughs> oh, I can have a look. Um, in, in terms of the games that went on in midweek, almost because, I don't want to say they were irrelevant, but in terms of our perspective in this programme is we are getting through a season and what happens, happens. And, you know, the, of course, the finals will be meaningful. And, and, of course, the games mean something to those involved. But to the, those on the sidelines, they are just seeing the rugby league games on the telly. So I'm not watching a repeat of Holby City or something. Um, Salford beating Warrington in a tight game. St Helens and Wigan, I mean, I turned off because... The result was not in doubt, and I didn't have too much interest in the game. But at least the Salford Winton game was a, a tight encounter, and Salford only leading only leading for eighty-one seconds. But the only eighty-one seconds that mattered. Yeah, I, I think of all the games that we saw uh, in midweek, uh, the the one that really mattered was. Castleford and Hull, which is not to gloss over the other games. I mean, clearly, Warrington and Salford was played in the shadow of the two teams meeting again in a, a Challenge Cup final. Uh, Saints getting knocked out of the cup. Clearly, um, they're looking to consolidate their their title. Um, so they didn't go easy on Wigan. You, you get that for for 60, for 60 minutes, you know, kids will give their absolute everything. But sooner or later, they they can't match the physicality. You know, it's again very, very similar in in, in that game. Um, you know, with the with um, Wigan and Saints, that the, the kids were fantastic, and the score blew out with two late tries in the second half. But you knew when you saw those team sheets that there wasn't going to be an upset because the Dragons are trying to take fourth spot off Leeds. I think what we've learned is that probably three teams are nailed on for the top four. And that, that fourth spot now, you're going to need to have won probably two-thirds of your games to get it. And it's either going to be Leeds or Catalan. Huddersfield, who are coming up on the rails, three wins under Luke Robinson. And, you know, they, they're they looking as though they're building something. The, the worry there is that, you know, they were down to the coach driver would have played if anybody else. Had. And it was a home game, so they didn't even have a coach, uh, as in driver, not coach. Um uh, and, you know, th that's a concern and, and possibly Hull because they've beaten Castleford and Castleford now, you would think, not got enough games to get themselves back into that top four. So that was the game that I think we all watched uh, that, that had meaning. The others, yeah, you're right. We're, we're getting through fixtures. I almost feel bad for saying that because obviously the players are still going out there and giving their all two, three times a week, it, it seems, uh, at the moment. But, you know, it is what it is, as the, as, the, as the president of the free world says. It is what it is. We are fulfilling our obligations to our host broadcaster. We're doing everything we can um, to try and get fans back into grounds. That's now been taken away from us, but clearly we backloaded a fixture list to be able to do that. Um, I think we said on this programme last week that I now wouldn't be having midweek games because we've bought in this percentage calculation. Um 
So I, I would rather see less than more. I don't, I don't want to see more injuries that are unnecessary or wear and tear. Um, but we just have to do whatever it is we have to do to get everyone out the other side and and start again in 2021, all being well. Hull, Mark Sneed's kicking game. What more can you say about that? They, they look like they'd lost and then the, suddenly he comes up with another piece of magic. Well, he did, but um, I, I do think there was there was more about Jake Connor in that game. That, that That's the subject that we always talk about. When he's on, he can be unplayable. And actually, the, the touches that he had probably were the difference between the two teams. And, um, you know, he, he was at his best on, on, on Thursday night. He... he the three particular things that he did that all led to points were the difference between the teams. And um, I, I, I don't know what the issue is at Cass at the moment. I get what Daryl Powell is saying about they're competitive in virtually every game and they're not losing by very much. But I, I don't know. I was watching that game thinking Hull can only play a certain way. Um, they're a big team that were bought with that in mind. And sometimes that'll work for you, particularly in certain weather conditions. But under different rules, you perhaps need more variety. And, and it's unfortunate in some ways for Hull that we have bought in six to go and uh, you know, speeded the game up because they, they recruited a certain way. Whether they're playing to their potential or not, that's another matter. But Castleford seemed to me to have lost their identity a little bit. That... Um, you know, they almost tried to fight too much fire with fire going up the middle with, with Hull, I thought, than, than trying to spread the ball. And um, I, I, I don't know, the, I, I, I really feel for, for Daryl and what he's trying to do, but don't blame the referees. It's, it's the mix of the team that, that, that isn't working for you at the moment. Some of that's clearly down to injury. Some of it's down to choice of tactics. Some of it's down to... Um, you know, mistakes that players are making are not necessarily officials. There were at least three times in that game on Thursday night where senior players dropped the ball cold. Uh, that's not a referee. We saw that the winners got Tuna on the pizza and thought, yeah. not for us. Uh, be facetious just in case people uh, miss that out. Uh, as, yeah, anyway, uh, before, before I get in trouble for something else. Um, so that, that was the week in Super League. Um, I, just on the final thing on that Cass Hull game, uh, listening to Andy Last in the press conference yesterday, he made a very interesting point afterwards, uh, which is amusing because uh, the club had just tweeted, oh, how, how great the debut was for Ben McNamara. And he, and he said after the game, you know, let's not, let's not get carried away because we do in sport, in, in life in general. Someone has one good game and we decide that they, you know, the next big thing. You know, let, let's let's keep calm. Let's see what happens. You know, he's thrown into it. He did well, but you know, we don't know when we're going to see him play again. Because as you mm. say, we, we might not see any of these young players ever play again in the first team for these teams because we've seen it all before. But we'll we'll, we'll see what happens. It, it must be hard though, and, and you know, I could never follow in my father's footsteps because they closed all the pits. Um, but for the likes of McNamara and, and especially Hamley, obviously, who's got the the big name and reputation to live up to. It must be hard because everyone who goes to speak to them will say, "Oh, your dad was good, wasn't he?" You know, blah 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 blah, and and that's an, another extra pressure on these young players that have that uh, that name to live up to. Well, we were playing a game at Headingley on uh, Wednesday, whilst watching the rainfall in copious amounts. That uh, obviously this is the round that's sort of been christened "Son of." And we had four major ones, uh, one, one of whom was about to make his debut. Uh, well, two of them, four, four leads, you know, Carl Harrison's son, James, and uh, Terry O'Connor's son, James, uh, along with Hanley. And we were trying to think of father and son combinations where both had had the same sort of impact in terms of absolutely stellar. Because the, the, you know, the label that you carry as the, the next generation is, is a really heavy one. Um, you know, our, our good friend Jonathan Schofield, um, fine player, but before he'd even stepped on the field, it was being compared to his father, um, Sir, Sir, Sir Garfield. And, um, and obviously when he ended up going and playing, you know, had, had a, a career in, in the Australian 
uh, country divisions, but never quite got the opportunity to show what he could do without immediately being compared to what had gone before him. And the the only real two families that I could think of were clearly the Rismans, Gus and Bev. Um, you know, Gus, a, a Hall of Famer, along with his son, and Bev, you know, captain the World Cup team. So I don't think there's there's any argument that that they had equal equal billing and and the others probably the Sullivans Clive and Anthony um uh you know in terms of internationals career n- not dissimilar um you know both made a, a massive impact when they played arguably you know Clive because he was a historic figure uh, in what he achieved it probably got more more recognition um and and at this point it's probably a very good Good juncture to pay tribute to Cardiff City Council, who um, I don't know if people saw the story during the week, but uh, the Tiger Bay area has produced a, a lot of players, uh, um, particularly of ethnic origin, who've come and, and played rugby league and been duly commemorated and lauded up here, had roads named after them and statues built. And, and in their home city, they've never been recognised, but they're now going to have a, a statue to three of them. 13 appropriately been nominated you can go on the cardiff city council website and pick your three and i think that's brilliant but apart from the the risman's um and gus is another of the the ones who you can vote for came from the the, the tiger bay area and the sullivans i i can't really think of any others there will be you know we'll get seven thousand people now going oh you forgot about the dixons and the but it doesn't automatically follow that just because you are the son of a great, you will be a great. That's plenty of brothers, obviously, but I, I can't think of any other. Th- those were the two in my mind as well. And obviously, you know far more than I. So um, we can open it up to the, the, the viewership of mm-hmm. this program. I'm sure they will uh, uh, it bombard us with names of those who uh, we have forgotten. The, the good news for the NHS is, of course, I think following my mum's footsteps because she's a nurse and uh, I would have been terrible at that job. But I can't even look after, you know. Don't look after a cat or a no. dog. Let, let, let. And, and to be fair, I was never going to be a civil engineer or a ballet teacher. <laughs> oh dear. Particularly one of those two. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Um, right. Well, on, on, on this, on that bombshell, we'll we'll, we'll take a quick. <laughs> I'll play. A, I'll play an exciting graphic I've just made, and then we'll be speaking about life in France with probably an obvious edit with uh, our, our friend. Uh, Jai Hitchcock, so stay there. I uh, can't wait to hear what he's got to say. I know. We'll be saying bonjour, or perhaps more likely in this programme, hello, hello to Jai. I'm wondering if you'd uh, heard anything definitive over there yet, because the initial indications here are that maybe the Championship and League One won't start until March next year now at the earliest. That's what I've been hearing. Um, I think pretty much everything that we get, uh, we put forward to the AFL, they come back with, I don't know, and I'm not sure, and we don't know what's going on. So, um, you know, same sort of story throughout rugby league uh, the last few years is the players find out on the internet, the players find out on Twitter, the players find out on podcasts, um, but we don't know what's going on. Um, the last thing we've heard is that uh, championship teams don't want to go forward with... Uh, without crowds and without crowds the government announced not until about March so that's the last thing we've heard because it's a shame obviously that the season ended so suddenly for you because you'd won five games out of five perfect start for Toulouse yeah pretty sad really that we um, couldn't continue the season we've signed really well Um, we've got a good squad Uh, we've got a tight squad small squad but a good squad Um, yeah, disappointing that we got off to such a good start and then the virus come along. But um, look, I think we've made some positive signings again for next year. Uh, so is a lot of championship teams. So I think, you know, championship is going to be probably, I feel like we say it every year, that's going to be the best championship yet. But uh, I really believe that next year is going to be a cracking championship. Clearly, uh, we don't do controversy on this show either, as you know. But um, if in the unlikely event that Toronto weren't coming back in and it's an 11-team competition that doesn't work logistically and they're looking for a 12th team to come in and whatever process that goes through uh, becomes looking at the likely candidates. How ready would Toulouse be to step straight into Super League if you were asked to do that? I think we're already doing things that uh, other teams aren't. So 
we're already paying for teams to come here. Um, that's straight off our bat. We're obviously travelling there. I don't know how much it is exactly, but I think it's sort of upwards of 25k each trip. So, look, we're financially in a really good position. Um, we're paying out of state to lose, which is, I don't know if anyone's been there, that's home of the, arguably the kings of uh, rugby union in Europe. Um, I think they spend roughly around 4 million on their pitch um, annually. So, uh, it's a very good pitch, a really good location. Um, yeah, I think we sort of tick all the boxes as you look at other championship teams. I'm not saying that they don't tick all the boxes, but there's been some dramas in the past, with, especially with the top-end championship teams. Um, we're a full-time team. Um, and as I said, yeah, I think we tick all the boxes and I think a second team in France would be great. You know, Catalans has been arguably pretty successful. Um, we could do sort of like a local derby with them and um, build rugby league in the France. Uh, we've already got an A-grade competition that runs locally within France that's, that's ready to kick off. So um, I think, uh, you know, the pathways are there and I don't, I don't see why Toulouse shouldn't be looked at in pole position if there was a mini licensing sort of thing. How big do you think that would be for, for the club if you were in Super League alongside Catalans and having those big fixtures year in, year out against each other, a, a big rivalry to grow? Yeah, I think it'd be massive. Like when you talk about ex- expansion, I, I, I'm still for Toronto... Um, coming into the competition, if they can't come in the competition and they can't pay their players, that's obviously a whole new ball game, and they don't deserve to be there, in my opinion. But um, look, we've we've done nothing uh, that says we shouldn't be in the competition. We've done nothing that says we we can't compete in Super League. I think we've signed well. Um, I think if we were to go to Super League, that we wouldn't be relegated either. So um, yeah, pretty confident with everything the club's doing at the moment. So we're really really enjoying it as well. And the big topic that we're talking about this week over here particularly is the number of young players that have been given an opportunity with it being a midweek round of matches. What's the junior development system like in France? Because I think if there was one minor criticism of what the Dragons are doing at the moment, it's almost as if they've lost their French identity. They're signing a certain player to play a certain way, which, which may or may not be effective. Certainly won them the Challenge Cup, but... There doesn't seem to be the same opening for young, talented French players. Is that the same at Toulouse or are you doing it a bit differently? Um, look, I think generally and a whole, if you're going to look across globally at rugby league, obviously Australia's pathways and stuff like that are really good. Um, you know, you've got deep roots to rugby league. You look at England, it's probably a bit further off Australia. And then if you look at France, it's probably roughly a little bit off England. So uh, I don't think you're going to exactly pick the cream of the crop from the lower competitions, which is the same in England, really. If you want a specialised halfback, you're not going to look at League One and, and Championship. You're probably going to sign an, an overseas Australian halfback. And that's what a lot of high-end teams are doing. I don't think that'll change. But look, they do have a strong competition here. Um, it's not obviously up to Championship standard or anything, but I think that uh, the stronger teams in the lower grades in France would definitely compete in a high-end League One. You mentioned the, uh, the, the temperature is obviously a bit warmer in uh, the south of France and uh, deepest, darkest West Yorkshire. What else attracted you to uh, make the move across the channel at the end of last year? Mate, it was really uncertain when, I, when with everything happened with Bradford. So obviously I had another year on that contract. Um, I sort of spoke to John Keir and just said, look, mate, it's, you know, unforeseen circumstances. I don't know what's happening. It was sort of kept in the dark what exactly what was going on with Bradford. And, and that was pretty disappointing there. But um, to JK's credit, he was actually really good and he helped me all along the way. He was actually great with all the players. And um, it must have been a really difficult situation for him because he was in the same boat as a lot of us. But um, I had a chat with him and just said, uh, if, if something does happen and it's mid-way through the year, obviously being a quota player, um, I think... 90% of quota spots were filled in the Super League, so, um, which is why I ended up going to Bradford in the first place. And then, um, but then being filled, and then there's only a select few of championship teams that are, one, have a few spots available, and two, going to be able to afford an overseas quota player. Uh, I was sort of at a crossroads where there was really minimal uh, teams that I could go and join. And I had the opportunity to come to Toulouse for two years. Something different. I'm always sort of looking for a new challenge. Um, Toulouse have played really well the last few seasons. They're in the championship. They're pushing for Super League. It was exactly what I was after when I joined Bradford. Had that not gone um, tits up, so to speak, it, it, um, it would have been ideal. But, yeah, that's why I came to Toulouse. And, um, yeah, really enjoying my time here. 
and the weather's just a little bit of a bonus. <laughs> Stop mentioning the weather. Um, the um, the other thing that's that's happening this year is now we clearly know there's going to be no championship and and League One and Super League squads are under massive pressure because of the amount of games that are trying to cram in by the end of the season. And there are some players now moving from. Uh, championship teams into the Super League on a short-term loan basis because there, there are exemptions out there. If if somebody came calling for you in, in a crisis, are you ready and available to, to play Super League for the remainder of this year? Yeah, I'm always ready. I, th- I thought that they might... Um, I've, seen, I've seen an exemption with Toronto players where you could sign anyone from Toronto. I thought if they weren't going to run a championship, and let's look at the, like, the figures, there's some championship sides that just aren't going to be able to compete or fund uh, if they go off the government furlough or or whatever it is, that's just that's just reality. So I thought that um, to strengthen a Super League competition, I know the one thing as a fan of rugby league and not just a player is I was sick of seeing you know jerseys number thirty five, thirty six, and thirty seven four weeks into the tournament, like four weeks into the competition. Not saying that they're not great up and coming young players, but you watch it, you want to watch a spectacle, you want to watch some great uh, footy. So I thought. Um, just as an idea that they might throw up was just to create anything goes from the championship or anywhere, um, sign as many quota players as you want. Um, if you're looking at strengthening squads, I thought that would be a no-brainer, but obviously that's not how it's gone. <laughs> if you can play halfback, you can probably get in uh, at Castle with them. It was Grant Millington playing at six yesterday uh, uh, yeah, against yeah, Hull. But I'm guessing uh, in, in training uh, at Cass, he must have always thought, he, you know, it's like all these fours. They all think they're halfbacks. They all think they're, they're smarter than they are, don't they? He actually, no, he's actually a pretty intelligent bloke, Milo, but no, he, he's filled in at half a few times. I think he played six, maybe three or four times when I was there. And um, Look, he didn't go too bad. He's a, he's a warrior, old Milo. Maybe you just need to be the son of a famous player to play in uh, Super League at the moment. Because I think, did we have four in this current round? Uh, one named Hanley for sure, and then there's O'Connor, a Harrison, and a McNamara. So uh, you'll have to. I didn't even hear about Hanley. That Hanley played. Did he? The commentator mentioned him every two bloody seconds. <laughs> did, did did he? Did you not get the impression that he had? I think he he may have made his debut. I'm not sure. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> but no, nah, it's good to see all the young players getting a chance. But as I said, like I just, I just think the whole year has been a bit of a write-off with rugby league in general. Like um, changing it to the percentages, which I think that'll going to have to continue with the way the virus is and testing and all that sort of stuff. So, so the big question is: nineteen kids have made their debut in this midweek round. Clearly, some of them will give be given another opportunity with the midweek rounds that we've got to come. But what if you were a young player now and you'd been given your debut, admittedly on pittance of a money, which is something that we need to look at. Uh, yeah. What is the next step for a really talented young player? Clearly, they're too good for the academy system. Reserve system's been shelved and we're not sure yet whether there's enough players to make that work properly. Dual reg is, is being tried, but it's not the same at every club. It's, some clubs do it better than others and some have more reason to do it than others. If, if you were a 19-year-old being given a, your first chance this week, would you be concerned that you don't know where your next game's coming from? And, and as a game, should we be looking at better pathways for young kids? Potentially, yeah. But the, the other big issue is um, players not being able to play for X amount of time. I mean, I know it sort of works on both ends of whatever age you are. For me personally, uh, I'm 31 now. How many good years do I have left in me? If I've had a year off rugby league, you know, when does that finish? But more importantly, for the junior guys, as you said, getting no money, n- no support from the club, really, financially. They're, they're playing for peanuts. Where That's enough for a young kid to go, I don't want to play anymore. You know, For me, I'm, I'm always going to play. If you're a 25, 26, 27-year-old, you're always going to continue playing. But a young fellow that's 17, 18, 19, that's enough for him to say, right, I'm done with footy, I'm going to get apprenticeship. You know what I mean? So I think I think that's a that's a real key issue that the the, the clubs are going to have, especially when you've got reserves and dual reg and all, and all these things going on. I don't see how dual reg even survives, let alone reserve grade. Um, Super League teams need as many players as they can get right now, and we're going to what hand them on to championship clubs. I, I just don't see how it's all going to work. Um, I've always sort of said that the the best way forward is to mimic the NRL with a Super League and a reserve grade. 
But for the reserve grade to work, the championship needs to either become the reserve grade or need to be scrapped. But the thing is that I learned once I got to England and lived in England is people don't want to let go of that crest. That's a really important thing to them and they value it highly, which, which I can totally understand. But um, look, if you want the bigger picture of the game, I think you need Super League and a reserve grade to Super League, which would be the championship. But unfortunately, you'd have to lose um, these crests and these badges that people love so much. But look, um, yeah, that's just my point. That's just my thought. <laughs> but you've come up with the perfect solution, but obviously that's, that's not going to happen. It's, it's, no. <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, it's like promotion relegation license versus licensing and reserve grade versus dual reg and everything. There, every single solution that seems to be out there seems to end the the dreams quote of, of, of some clubs and it seems like we're never going to be able to get past that. I think if you want expansion, if you want to, if you want to turn teams into, you know, powerhouses, if you want to get off the bottom of the relegation pile, if you, if you want to improve and, and progress throughout any of this, you, you need change. And all, all great things come with, a, with change. So, uh, look, people can either bite their lip about it and say, oh, I won't support rugby league. If, you don't, if, you don't, if they don't want to support rugby league after they lose their identity or whatever it is or their crest or they can't walk down the lane to Post Office Road or <laughs> wherever they might be going, like, that's just being bitter. You're still going to watch rugby league. You're still going to be a rugby league fan. And, and to progress... Like, it's the same teams that win Super League each year. It's, just, it's the same top four. It's just, You can pick the results every week. Like, it's just, there's, uh, at some stage, people have got to get together and go, look, this ain't working. In terms of the New South Wales League, I'm, I'm assuming that that's where you started your career and you were picked up by, uh, by NRL clubs. They have their own identity and their own competition in its own right, but they are genuine feeder clubs of the competition that brings the money in. Is that that sort of halfway house model that we should be looking at, that you retain your identity in a separate competition, but all your development is linked to a club that plays in a, in a higher league? Yeah, well, so the, basically the main structure within the NRL is you've got a top 30. So within your top 30 um, or top 25, they used to call it, so the minimum pay bracket for a top 25 player when I was playing used to be about 45, 50K. That's gone up to now, I think it's going into 100K. So the minimum you can be paid to be in that is 100K. Now, if you think about you've got a top 30 with 18 playing each week and 19th as a sit by reserve, you know, you've got 11 players that are going to fall back into your reserve grade. There's only a few standalone teams in the New South Wales Cup competition, like Newtown. Newtown Jets, but they partner with the Sydney Roosters. So basically, Newtown Jets, like where you're like Jackson Hastings and stuff for playing, um, they'll have 11 players that are in and around a first grade system that really works under the correct coaches and around the right players they need to be around. And they'll fall back into the same competition every week. So really, the structure and the plays and the, you know, the dialogue and everything that you need to follow with Newtown is the same as the Sydney Roosters. Vice versa with, say, West Tigers. Their reserve grade is, was, is called West Tigers or West Magpies or whatever it may be. But it's the same system, the same structure. But what we're doing is we're sending two players to Bradford and three players to Featherston and I want this player down here and this guy's young and you can take him. How much money can I get from these young players? Just send them all out and then hope for the best. But really, what's, where's the upside to that? The upside is if the young 19-year-old kid goes and kills it, the club doesn't have enough money to pay his next year's contract and he leaves. <laughs> I mean, it's just... Or you become a finishing school for Rugby Union or the NRL. I mean, we saw one of the kids who played for, for Wigan this, this week, Harry Rushton. If, if he hadn't made his debut, he would have been going to Canberra before he'd even made the Wigan first. Exactly. And again, whatever it's cost to, to get him to that point in his career is money you never get back. So is this the time? And we've talked about it a lot on these programs and in the magazine. And I know you've, you've been on Twitter about it as well. Big, deep thinker about the game. Is this a blank sheet of paper moment? The, the things we're talking about, feeder systems, not necessarily clubs, um, how, how you move ahead with quotas, relegation, promotion, payment for players. Should, should this now be the sole focus of the sport for the next three or four months to come up with a new version of it for when we do fully restart? 
I think so, but I also think like the core of it all of how everything comes about is needs to change as well. I mean, rugby league, you look at it, you see things coming happening on football, and look, I know we don't really compare it because football's got all the money in the world and whatever, but just how it all goes about. Like we've got a meeting scheduled for the 12th and people will find out and then the 12th comes and it goes and no one knows anything and no one's done but wiser. I mean, I just, I just think something needs to happen. Something needs to change in order for the game to grow. We can't just keep sitting here doing the exact same thing in the exact same position, the exact same situation and, and with no benefits. I mean, that's not just players, that's clubs, that's fans, that's, that's everyone. Um, I think just big changes need to happen, and, and if they don't, we're no better, we're no worse off than what we are. Is it is it purely that people are scared, and, and it goes back to what you were saying earlier, Joy, that their their crest won't exist anymore if we if we do make changes, and they, they don't want to lose that identity that we have to keep doing what we keep doing. If, I mean, I imagine if you're on the field and you played the same way every single set in a match you're going to get found out, found out very quickly by your opponents and it's the same off yeah. the field as well it's exactly the same i mean uh, that is a i can fully understand that that's a would be a bitter pill to swallow to lose your crest but like other teams have done it. i mean west tigers merged with magpies then then they won a grand final in 2005 i mean these things happen and teams grow and they get better and and teams uh, either sit there and struggle or do something that's going to change for the better. I think um, I'd like to see a, like a Cumbrian team. I don't know why they haven't merged. And obviously it's because of they've got that rivalry and that they don't want to lose that crest. But they would be, a, instead of being two bottom teams, they would be a strong mid-table to up their championship team. Do you know what I mean? But it just, they just, it just doesn't happen. It's strange. I don't want to sound like I'm, oh, I'm that Aussie guy just bashing uh, UK rugby league, but it just seems a lot of people are stuck in their ways about change. They just, they don't want it. They want to complain about it, but they don't want it. They don't want it to happen. <laughs> I think they want it to happen as long as it doesn't affect them directly. Um, which is why you've got to be unpopular when you, when you talk about change and it's got to be, rather than change for change's sake. In, in some respects, we had that with the, with the eight system, that it, it, it was sort of, the, the drawbacks were obvious when it was brought in. And after two or three years, we said, oh, look, there's some drawbacks with this. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're going to have proper and realistic change, it has to be something that stands the test of time. And time is something that we, we, we never spend a lot of, uh, well, a lot of time on in rugby league. Um, I, Thinking about the NRL as well, because because you know you, you brought that up there that we're always being compared, but we're very fortunate that we get to to look at it this this year in particular. We've seen more games probably on Sky than than ever before, and you look at a team like Penrith who just made it through to the equivalent of the semi-finals, one game away from playing in a grand final last year. They were tenth. You look mm. at Brisbane who historically have been one of the more successful times this year first ever wooden spoon that clearly is more interesting for every set of fans where you start on the the line at the beginning of the season and you genuinely don't know who's going to win the competition is that yeah. what we're missing do you think i think so but there's a there's also a special article that came out and it was actually a video as well like penrith's been struggling for years right and um but they've got very strong grassroots rugby league they've got uh, great pathways you know phil good coming did there and he got some criticism but he actually did some pretty great things um just their pathways in their grassroots rugby league and they they made it about penrith you know what i mean people want to play from penrith they want to play for penrith they don't want to go to the beaches they don't want to like penrith right way out west like you i wouldn't want to live there but look they made people want to love to be in penrith and they expanded they made they, they went down all the way down uh, south to south side sydney and they've got a great population of people now that want to watch Penrith, that want to play for Penrith and that want to be in Penrith. And um, I think their team culture is what's changed. Uh, they've obviously got a great coach, and a, but they've got a really young spine and uh, they're playing some really fantastic footy. But um, look, I think that's another thing what ties into your dual reg and your, um, your agreements where you toss young players out all over the shop and whoever gets the most money. I mean, I, I just think, I just think dual reg and everything oh, is just ridiculous. But um, yeah, they don't have that there. They don't have that in the NRL. And if they do, it's they're still playing for Penrith. They're just playing for Penrith's reserve grade. Do you think we'll see Benji Marshall come over here uh, at the end of the year? 
Don't know. I heard about a few rumours about that, but um, I think he'll get picked up by an NRL club. He's still a pretty classy player. Um, yeah, but you never know. I mean, it seems like someone else is coming over here every year. So, look, it's getting... Um, I'd like to see the quota spots completely erased from... Um, not just because I'm biased and there's only five and I'm an Australian, but um, I just think it would strengthen the competition. I sort of spoke to a few people about this and um, back when I was growing up and coming through the ranks and you were getting, you were getting not much money and you, I think you could probably get... You could pick up... Uh, fringe NRL player when I was coming through for about 25, 30K. Now, you know, that's that's like 17,000 pounds. But we're spending 120 on players that are coming over where you could get three or four players that are on the cusp of making their NRL debut if, if it wasn't for the quota rule. The quota rule sort of become a marquee pick the cream of the crop. And you look in each team, the Aussies are up there with the either marquee or the most paid player on the team. Whereas if you opened up that quota spot, you could gain, you know, three Grant Millingtons five years ago, you know, for the, but now you only get one. I think um, the only downside to that is, you know, there's the argument that, oh, you're taking a young English player's spot. But look, what, what are we looking at here? We're looking at who's got the best rugby league team. If you're not good enough, you're not good enough. Um, that's, that's the way I see it. But um, pretty unpopular opinion, but yeah. <laughs> Oh, you're fitting on here then. Um, I, I, just, I just want to take you back because uh, it's almost three years now since Casford won the League Leader Shield and got to the grand final. You, you mentioned earlier about uh, it's the same teams winning Super League every year. How confident were you heading into that week? Obviously, things changed during the week, but how confident in that week were you that Casford could finally break through and lift that uh, Super League title? Yeah, look, we were always confident, but even just throughout that whole year, it became like a, it was strange. Um, I think you, when you're in good teams, you sort of enter games with like uh, another one, another tough game coming up, another tough game coming up. But we were just like going with the flow and, and we're just winning. Like It was always like a belief on the field amongst the players. You know, you, you get this like certain vibe where it was just like, we're winning. Like, we were down by 10. We're down by 20. I think one week we put out, um, I think Jake Truman and that, when he made his debut, um, we had so many young players. Um, uh, we played Saints at home and we they were beating us and we come back and even beat them. And there was just a belief amongst the whole club that no matter what happens here, we're going to win. Um, and obviously that week leading to the grand final, well, I wasn't playing. I was 18th man. And um, obviously, Zach, um, with that, what happened to him, uh, I got called into the side onto the wing. So I only had one training session and then we went up to Old Trafford the next day. Um, so, yeah, it was all pretty bizarre for me. But I, I just think the whole moment got um, got a hold of us. Uh, there, was a, there was an interview I watched maybe a week earlier which said there was something like 20 players in the Leeds team that had played in the grand finals or big games and, and we only had one which is Michael Shenton or something and then he, and he he lost that grand final I think that was a really good point that got overlooked it was just um, not until you walked out there was it just you know playing in front of 70 plus thousand people and then playing in front of 6,000 at Cass it's it's a, it's a whole different ball game. Uh, you couldn't hear anything. The the field was really dewy and there was light rain. It was like a, the field was like slippery. Like I don't know what they put on the surfaces there, but it was just a whole different experience. And um, yeah, I think they just got a hold of us. And of course, what we've seen this week is the the game between Cass and Hull, which effectively was going to be a decider on who might make the four. We're not sure because of percentage, but it looks like you're going to have to win at least two thirds of your games to, to be in the top four where Cass are at the moment. And that narrow defeat that they suffered again uh, this week probably means that they're not going to make it now. And almost if you chart from that grand final to where they are now, it, it's been downhill. Could you see that at the time? Could you sense that that was your moment in history? And if you didn't grasp it, it was going to be hard to get to that summit again or are you surprised that um, maybe the season's petered out in 2020 albeit it's a season like no other I think that sort of last point you made there season like no other is, is hit the nail on the head I mean teams are struggling teams you know it's not just financially that teams are in trouble it's 
players not being able to see each other, players not being able to, you know, a month, two months, three months, lockdown, whatever it is, you, you, you miss that camaraderie. You miss that um, chance to build rapport with your teammates. You miss that um, gelling each day and re the repetition and the consistency of what you go through of being a rugby league player. Like, we, you look at it, we spend six, six, seven hours with each other every day and you suddenly go into an environment where you don't see each other at all. All gyms are closed taken home as much weights as you can, but you've stuck with, you know, 16 kilo dumbbells and you're at home with the missus. Like, it's just, um, it's just different crazy times. Some teams are struggling with it and some teams have got a lot of depth with no injuries. I mean, Cass have suffered some, some serious injuries on and off the field. I think Watsy nearly cut his arm off with a sore or something the other week. So teams are struggling, not just financially, but on the pitch, off the pitch. There's different things going on. There's pay cuts, there's... It's, it's pretty crazy time. So I don't think you can put too much pressure on side saying, oh, look, you didn't live up to expectations this year. I just think um, it's just one of them things. And, I, and I, honestly, I don't know how long it's going to last. I can see it pushing right into next year and with whatever's going on. It's just crazy times. But, yeah, I think it's just a total write-off the season at the moment. I'm glad the footy's back and we get to watch it. But, geez, there's some – just just ordinary. <laughs> Uh, Phil, have you got anything else? I know we're uh, running short on time. Well, obviously, the big, um, the great hope on the horizon is the World Cup at the end of next year, which we're still hoping is going to go ahead. Good news is ticket sales are really strong. Started uh, less than a week ago, and they're above expectations. Who can you play for if it isn't Australia? Is there any Irish in you? Is there a bit of Scottish, a bit of Welsh? Uh, um, can, can we, can we see it? I can play for the Kiwis. My my dad and all his whole family are born in Dunedin, New Zealand. So um, yeah, I don't see myself making Australia and New Zealand anytime soon. <laughs> uh, I might look up the bloodline and see if I got some Irish in me or something like that. I've been to Dublin a few times. Is uh, Temple Bar gets you ten percent Irish? I think. Well, Tony Cascarino played for the Irish uh, football team and had no connection at all. And uh, but that was back in the days when no one knew these things. But he, he's rugby league. He probably could sneak you in somehow. I reckon you're getting, you're getting the French team on residential grounds. Yeah, that's the one. Or Italy. I wouldn't mind a little trip to Rome. Uh, final one from me, Jai. Uh, less serious. Uh, when, uh, you know, I, I've, I've been doing this for a while now, this radio stuff, uh, and turned it into podcasting, whatever this is. I, I've never been as nervous as I was sat across the desk from you and Ollie because I never knew what you were going to uh, what you were going to say uh, I'm, I'm glad tom did it all the time and i just had to fill in for him once oh uh, mate i really enjoyed that show actually i still get well i've got the tattoo on my ass actually still so um because i lost the <laughs> i lost a bet where uh whichever show got 10,000 views first uh had to get the tattoo so um yeah but i really enjoyed that and people they uh, love to listen to it so um no, i enjoy it i think there should be more podcasty things like this uh, all across the board but um that's no, pretty good Still keeping up with all the weird news in the world? Yeah, mate. I try and stay active on the weird news front, but um, two kids now, so they very much run me life. Lockdown with them too. <laughs> well, I, you know, we'll, we'll issue a come and get me plea here for people to uh, to give you a new podcast so you can talk about all the uh, the weird things in the world. Um, yeah, mate, thanks. Get me on every now and then I'll toss some weird news your way. <laughs> Uh, thanks for thanks for your time this afternoon. Um, I guess we, we have to say stay safe to everyone because we don't know what's around the corner and, and hopefully we uh, see you back on the pitch soon. That's it, mate. Cheers. Yeah, I hope so. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Keep practicing those acrobatic tries. Will do. I've got them in the locker. Don't worry. Right, we're back. It, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it, Joey? I mean, I, I spent you know one show uh, at uh, Radio Yorkshire opposite him and Ollie Holmes talking absolute nonsense for two hours. But actually, when you get him to speak about rugby league, he speaks a lot of sense. Yeah, I think, again, players having a voice is something that we've spoken a lot about. And it's not always just about union representation. It's about, you know, just hearing what they've got to say about issues. And clearly, everybody won't agree with uh, the way he sees the rugby league world. But let's debate it. And uh, if we don't include players in that, then we're certainly missing out on something. Well, he's another one of those players who speaks well and you think he'd do well as a... Uh media person and he's not a forward either so uh of which that everyone is a forward apart from when i did the analysis i realized not everyone actually is a forward. <laughs> <laughs> and there are some who are not but there's only about two halfbacks and john wells he's a winger but apart from that it's all right i mean we're all excited because it is challenge cup semi-final weekend 
Uh, the, Wembley is on the horizon. There's going to be no one at Wembley. Um, I don't, I don't, I, unless uh, someone asks me to work there, I don't think I'm going to be there because uh, I, I don't. People won't realise this, but for everyone who works at Wembley as a journalist, they have to pay. <laughs> to the RFL, <laughs> so I'm not going. I'm not going to add an extra cost on to when I can watch it on the telly. And I'm hoping these uh, post-match press conferences continue virtually forever because I'll, mm. I'll never leave the house again until I'm forced to find uh, gainful employment. Um, but we've got two semi-finals at 40. We mentioned uh, Solfer and, and Warrington obviously met in in Super League in the week. Uh, we can expect a much changed Warrington team, of course, but. This is a big opportunity for Solvent. Yes, it's a year when no one's going to be there to see it, but having made the grand final last year, this really is the, the one which will tug at the heartstrings of the general populace, perhaps, of the great city of Salford, because it is Wembley, it is the Challenge Cup. It's got so much history attached to it, and they haven't been there since 1969. Yeah, it was still in black and white in those days. I can, um, I can honestly say that the reason we're looking forward to this is because we genuinely don't know who's going to win either semi-final. And I'm not even sure there's a favourite. Clearly, in terms of league form, Warrington are. Um, but there's something about this Salford team that they showed in particularly the playoffs last year that with the coach that they've got who is shrewd enough to um, come up with tactics that will worry whoever they're playing and a belief that they can now win big games. You can't write them off. Uh, by the same token, taking away the, the defeat that they had against Salford because whilst they would never have sacrificed that game, they clearly made a conscious decision that they were going to keep a lot of their powder dry for the semi-final. Warrington are the form team at the moment. So, Nothing to choose between them, I don't think. Um, it is going to come down to that. I was going to say ex experience of the big occasion, but of course, you also got to remember that these semi finals are played behind closed doors and they're really strange occasions that normally, whereas you know, we, we saw how brilliant the Salford fans were at the grand final last year, they, they might have been outnumbered but they made fantastic noise and they you know on that journey to old trafford and i don't mean the physical one but the games that they want to get up there and not not the walk across the road um fans were a really important part of that and they're not this time other than virtually so it's a different mindset um but the more experienced players that you've got the better. And I think that might just be where Warrington have the edge as holders of the competition. Um, their spine is playing so well at the moment. Um, I, I just suspect that this will be close, but I'm narrowly favouring Warrington to get back to Wembley. But it would not be a surprise. I mean, we've seen Hull KR get there, Castleford get there. Um, whole win there, which, which is never supposed to happen. Um, and it could be that this is Salford year to get there and, and whilst we quite rightly bemoan the fact that there isn't a new name on the Super League trophy year after year we are getting new names and, um, and Salford could be the next one uh, so Warrington narrowly but could be Salford that'll please the Warrington fans that are always in the comments Andy Bibby we see what you oh, so, you know so, you're yeah sorry Salford have to win sorry just to keep Andy happy um, the game on BBC One because that's on BBC Two is Leeds and Wigan which you know, it, it, it's the bigger game in terms of names on the marquee and whatever, and it, you know, it might pull in an audience. I don't know what else is on uh, on on Saturday afternoon uh, apart from uh, an episode of uh, what's it called that program I watch? Oh, I can't think what it's called. Bargain Hunt. That's it. That's the leading channel. Arms challenge. under the hammer. Arms under the hammer. Uh, oh, there's racing on ITV, Ascot, and repeats of four in a bed. So it might get a good uh, good crowd. Uh, Leeds and Wigan, the two most successful teams in the competition's history, it says on my uh, box in front of me. And this one will have, of course, plenty of changes from uh, midweek, so it can read in absolutely nothing to those games at all. No, and very little between these teams as well, I think. that um, whew, Again, it's going to come down to which team remains the, the calmest under pressure. There'll be periods in the game where they'll need to make some decisions that will get their teams out of trouble or they'll need to take a chance because there won't, won't be that many. Um, personal crusades, people have got points to prove. So, I, again, 
nothing between them. It's impo- you know, how, how can you say who is going to be the more influential player, Jackson Hastings or Luke Gale? Jackson Hastings, who's tasted a grand final, who, who, you know, whether there's nobody there or not, tell me an Australian that didn't stay up till three o'clock in the morning to watch Wembley in their youth. Luke Gale, who's who's been there once and he's desperate to go back and, uh, you know, right, maybe proceed wrong. Or, it, it's, it's just got so much subtext to it. Um, Wigan probably would like a couple more experienced forwards, maybe to stick on the bench. Leeds without Harry Newman now, um, the injury he suffered, and it, you know, it, it sometimes fearless young players can be the difference between winning and losing. Zach Hardacre, who you know did so much for Leeds winning the Challenge Cup after their long run of all of it, um, and I genuinely do not know who is going to win. I, I really don't, other than. Head says one thing, heart says another. <laughs> well, it always will, won't it? But, but it, that's the good thing about matches where you don't know who's going to win. You, you're you going in there with, with excitement and trepidation. Well, I, think, I think the other thing is the weather forecast looks horrible, um, which well, means that will have impact. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, heavy rain, again, will determine that you can be the most expansive team in the world. But if conditions won't let you, then does it come down to the, the the test of your kicking game? You know who's who's got the better outlet, and uh, you know discipline will be massive in those conditions. You won't want to be giving away a lot of six agains. Um, so yeah, I I genuinely think because of the season that we're in, and this isn't a cop out, although clearly it is. <laughs> I don't know who's going to win either of these games, and no final combination would surprise me. But um, you know, it, it would be nice to have the. The, the, the two halves of the country represented, uh, which clearly means that Leeds would have to win. <laughs> I, I, I wonder how the pitch will hold up for that second semi-final if it is heavy rain for the first. It'll be interesting to see. Um, I, I'll, I'll mention the uh, the playoffs in uh, Australia. Obviously, um, I don't keep as close an eye on this as I should do, but Canberra Raiders, who keep the uh, Super League as their... Uh, Breeding ground, as you mentioned earlier, take on Cronulla, uh, Melbourne versus Parramatta, and on Sunday it's South Sydney versus Newcastle. Which, I guess, having what we said at the start of the program, that shouldn't have these things shouldn't have an effect on the team of today when there are allegations about players and things going on two years ago, or whatever. Should they? So, I wouldn't imagine they should. They- but it will cast a cloud. They'll be yes. under greater scrutiny off the field and it will have an impact. I think if we could get anything like the game that was on, I mean, that's a, you know, that, that was on this morning. Yes. Um, I don't know when you're watching this, people, but <laughs> Friday morning, there was a game. Uh, we're recording Friday afternoon. Um, and if it's even a scratch compared to that match, then see if you can, listen to it if you can. Uh, w- one thing I would say is we're... we're both big fans of radio commentary. Done right, I still think it's better than television um, because a, a brilliant radio commentator paints the most wonderful pictures. Um, I, I think if you can't watch these games on Sky, ABC Grandstand or, or, or your platform of choice, but I would recommend them. Just it's magnificent at the moment. And the game that was on this morning that finished Penrith 29, Roosters 28, crikey, you, you'll have to go some to beat that. I know she's uh, only just picked up the Penrith Panthers bug, but Sandy was getting very excited on Twitter. I, I was very concerned. Um, we haven't talked about Toronto. There's no point talking about them because nothing's happened. Although, uh, if I can ever arrange it, we'll get Avery from Toronto on uh, next week, I think, to talk about what's going on. Uh, and I just want to hear how we ended up on the Inside Super League. Well, I want to know. I want to know. We have our own opinions of everything over here, yeah. um, and what should happen and what shouldn't happen. Be really nice to know what the thoughts are from from over there, from inside the city. And, and you know, it's all very well for us to tell them what they shouldn't shouldn't think and how they shouldn't shouldn't behave and value they shouldn't shouldn't have. But it'd be great to hear from somebody over there. Um, as to what what Toronto Wolfpack in a very short time has meant and brought to the city, and, and what we would be losing possibly if if we didn't find some way of readmitting them. Well, having managed to get a link to Fransley, I'm sure we can manage Canada next week. So I'll I'll arrange that and we'll get him on. 
Uh, we will be back on Monday to talk about everything that's happened this weekend. Well, one other game you haven't mentioned, well, and I, I think we should leave, should leave this to you, clearly. Um, Castle and Dragons, who will now be playing their third game in just over a week. Refreshed, rejuvenated and out of isolation Wakefield. Well, um, so I can imagine that um, you'll be confident at the two points. Well, it's not on telly, is it? Um, anywhere, not even on the Our League app. Um, so I'm going to have to listen. I'm, I'm assuming Bruno will be doing the commentary on the, the French. French. Yeah. So I mean, I did a year of French at school, but I, I, you know, I nearly did French and German for GCSE, but suddenly someone gave me a slap on the head and I decided not to. So I can't remember any of it. So I just hope they'll be going Ale 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 SI Wakefield all the time. Uh, and then I'll know we're winning because otherwise I won't have a clue. Um, if, if it get with 5,000 fans in the ground, if it suddenly goes very quiet, you'll know Wakefield have scored. Ooh, boo. And, and stuff. So, I, I, you know, I haven't thought about listening to it on French radio, but I may well do that because that, yeah. that might class as something to write about in my column next month. Well, I, there you go. I, I there thought, you go. I thought I was going to run out this month, but somehow managed to write some words. So, uh, I'll get a head start by talking about French radio. Well, like in the old days, tuning around on a shortwave radio to listen mm. to baseball or Spanish football. Oh, uh, radio Luxembourg, if you're as old as me. Yes, radio, the, 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 the station of the stars, uh, the Fab 208. Some uh, of whom we're not allowed to mention. No, 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 certainly, <laughs> certainly not these days. Just, you know, <laughs> I meant to mention earlier, we, we talk about, you know, making rugby players into heroes and role models or whatever. <laughs> I think it's a good job I didn't follow the path of many people in the industry I cho chose to uh, want to work in when I was a child. But never mind. One thing I would say about that, because I'm not sure if we discussed it, because it might have been in that small hiatus because two rounds have been played. Yes. Jake Mamer um, oh, yeah. yes. just thought that there is an indication whereby you could clearly never have scripted that, but that's what makes a sport go viral. He didn't say anything that anybody could object to. Um, he, his whole demeanour meant that he was going to go viral. And if you didn't know him or you'd never come across him, you would want to know more about the sport that he played. And, you know, I, I thought, A, he was brilliant. And I want to you more of it. And B, we shouldn't shy away or be embarrassed that he may have used a swear word. We certainly shouldn't apologise for it. It was in context. It got massive traction outside of rugby league. Full credit to him. It certainly went more viral than people intend to. So, you know. Um, I'm, I'm sure Sky won't be picking him to uh, do the post-match any time soon. I pick him every week on the basis of that. <laughs> yeah, Baz Ortez, if you're watching, uh, pick him as man of the match next week. Go on, do it. And ask him about tuna on pizza. Yeah. See, see, wind him up and watch him go. Oh, all the big issues, as ever. Uh, Phil, thank you very much. Enjoy, um, as always. Thanks to Jai. Back on Monday at some point. Um, I'll, I'll discuss the times uh, when we go off the air because you don't need to know that listener uh, but thank you very much for watching and uh, enjoy your rugby league that's what you should do <laughs>